We are recording. All right, again, my name is Teresa Becker. I'm the host for our presentation tonight about how to stay safe during the Kenai Peninsula trapping season. Um, before I go on to the next slide, I just, and I know my sister is out there. Um, the picture that I'm using to start this is my beautiful Aussie Libby, who was both mine and my sister's at one point. Um, she made it to 15 years. She died about a year and a half ago. And Libby spent almost every single day um, with me or my sister and our other dogs and our larger hiking group, um, hiking all over the Kenai Peninsula. So this topic is very important to us, how to keep ourselves safe and how to keep our animals safe during the traffic during the traffic, trapping season. Go ahead, next, please. Yes. So Alaska Wildlife Alliance, for those of you who are not familiar with this organization, um, is an Alaskan-based nonprofit organization that protects Alaska's wildlife through citizen mobilization, um, ad advocacy, and education. Next. And for purposes of this presentation, we're kind of going through the introduction pretty quickly because it's, uh, they've got a lot of information to get out to everybody, but some very important information is our virtual engagement guidelines. This is a family friendly presentation. And so we're really trying to avoid Zoom bombing. Um, you should see that your, your video and your uh, microphone is shut off. It should be, if it's not, please do that. Um, but then we're encouraging everybody to view in full screen mode. Um, if we encourage questions, we ask that you ask them through the chat function. Um, the questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation, but most importantly, enjoy and learn something new. The next person I'm going to introduce is our main speaker for tonight, who is Nicole Schmidt, and she is the executive director of the Alaska Wildlife Alliance. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you to all of you who are on. We're really excited to have you. Um, we have some uh, guest speakers here tonight, and we're going to launch right in. There's a lot of information, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, we feel very lucky to have Corey Stantorf here. He's the Assistant Anchorage Area Wildlife Biologist from Alaska Department of Fish and Game, who has generously donated part of his evening to do some live trap release demonstrations. And so um, to make sure that he can get off to uh, more exciting things, we're gonna start with those demonstrations now. So um, if you have a question for Corey during these trap um, release demonstrations, go ahead and ask it in the um, chat function and he'll be on for a little bit to answer questions before we move into the other part of the presentation. So um, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and Corey, you should pop up center stage. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. All right. So um, Nicole asked me here tonight to kind of show everyone the three main types of traps you may encounter out there while you're hiking and recreating in the back country. So um, we'll jump right into it. This first one, and I have a, is a snare. So this is designed to um, catch the animal by the neck and cut off blood supply, which is how these work. Um, these are very easy and light, as you can tell, to set out. So you may encounter these more regularly than the other ones. So you can see that this little lock at the top is what we have to what we have to use to open this snare back up. So as the animal comes through, it comes down and catches. So you can see the lock there. This is a one-way lock. So when I release pressure, the lock just stays there. It doesn't release automatically. In order to release this lock, you have to take it and bend it so that it meets the curve of the, of the wire here, and then it releases. So all I did was took this and tilted it, and it slides just perfectly. If it's straight up and down, it doesn't want to come back and relax. Um, most of the time when dogs get caught or animals get caught in these, especially 
um, dogs that are used to being on a leash, they typically don't fight this. It's almost like a choke collar. It comes to a point, they feel the tension and they stop. Um, now, not all dogs react this way, but a majority of them um, do because they're used to being on a leash. They're used to being, some of them are used to being stopped with a choke collar and stuff like that. Um, you know, stop the dog from moving or pulling any, anymore. And all you gotta do is come up, tilt this lock forward and it'll slide open and you can pull the, the dog right out of it. Um, these are designed to be hidden a little bit more. So these are usually put on uh, natural funnels or pathways where game is coming back and forth. There's usually not any bait. Um, so it's more of what, what they call a trail set. Um, and they put those on game trails and the animal just comes walking through and puts its head right through there. So the second one I'm gonna talk about is a foothold trap. So this trap is designed to catch the animal by the pads of its toes. So it's designed to catch it just like this. Um, these are also a pretty common type of trap found in the Kenai Peninsula throughout the state. Uh, so this isn't just for what you may, you may encounter down on the Kenai, but the possibility to encounter these elsewhere in the state, remote back country um, is also there. And these traps are, are the same. They have remained relatively unchanged um, since they were brought in uh, by the Russian fur trappers. So this trap has two coils right here. These are what provide the tension to keep the trap closed. So right now, this trap will not open by itself. In order to do that, you have to depress these two levers. And as you depress these, you'll see that these open up. So, um, like I said, these are designed to catch, um, the pad of the foot. And I'll show you here kind of what you have to do. But the, the again, the main thing is to get over the dog and stop them from moving and fighting the trap. Because that's where you start to see foot damage on, on the dog. So I'll set this here. So you push down. And then this opens up and you can pull the foot right out. So you can see that I'm using both hands. You may have to use a hand and a foot or put your palm here and then put your knee on this side. That way you can be over top of the dog and stop them from fighting and pulling against uh, the trap there. Now, these come in like two different flavors, I would say. Um, this one is what they call a coil spring trap. Hence the coils right here. There's another foothold trap that has really long springs that come out. That's called a long spring trap. And it's the same principle. All you're doing is compressing those springs to take the tension off the jaws here, which are these guys right here. Um, so this is a, this is a, the snare and the foothold are relatively easy traps to get animals uh, out of. You, the biggest thing to remember is you just got to stop the, the dog or whatever's caught in here from fighting against the trap because like I said that's where you start to see foot damage. These aren't designed to kill automatically. Um, so these usually if we see any damage it's to the foot and if you can get the pet, the dogs to stop fighting that um, and get to them pretty quick, this is pretty easy because I can actually do this with just my hands here. And as soon as you pull back like this, the dog is going to pull the the its foot out from these jaws. So the last trap that I have uh, here tonight, this is called a body gripper trap. And these are the traps that are designed to kill instantaneously. Um, and these are actually what are only, or 
in certain provinces of Canada, trappers are only allowed to use these kinds of traps. Um, so the, the principle behind these is you have the two springs on either side and in order to open this trap, you have to depress both sides. So you have to push this down and you have to pull that down in order for the jaws to open. So you can kind of see those jaws have opened up and now they've closed. There are two safeties on either side. So when you depress these springs, you latch these safeties so that the jaws or the springs uh, stay compressed so you can access this. So there are two main ways that these can be opened. This is called a trap setter, specifically designed for these body gripper traps. And what they do is these hook right into the eyes of those two springs. And as I compress, this does all the work for me. So you can see the safety is hanging right here. I latch that. And now that spring over here is compressed. But in order again, in order to open this, you have to do both sides. So don't think just one will be able to pull the dog out. Um, you have to do both sides. So we're just gonna rinse and repeat. We're gonna latch. Compress the spring. And then set that safety. So now this will open up and you can get whatever is stuck in here. Um, when these are set, I'll kind of show you what these look like. So when it's set, the trap looks like this. This goes over the top. When the animal comes in, it hits this trigger, pops that, the springs open up, and this folds <clears throat> down and it's designed to catch the animal behind the neck and mid back. So these are traps that if the, in the unfortunate event that a, a dog or who knows what gets into these, um, you have to work very, very fast to get the animal back out. Um, if you cannot get that animal out or you're having a hard time, um, the biggest thing is when it's on is to rotate this so that it's not compressing the trachea so you can keep air coming down. Um, sometimes, depending on the trap size, you know, a dog could get its foot into these. And a lot of times these traps have some sort of bait associated with them, um, either in a box or nailed up to a tree or something like that. So uh, there's a, a a lure to bring, you know, the lynx or the coyote or fox into it. Um, and just like wild animals, dogs also love smelly things. Um, so just be super aware. Um, this is a 120. So they come in a bunch of different sizes. So this is one of the pop most popular sizes for Martin, uh, mink, those small weasels. And then we have traps like this. You can see that size difference, right? A 120 here, and this is a 330. So this style body gripper is designed to catch wolverine, wolves, lynx. Um, these are the traps that are designed to catch the, the big powerful um, animals. So you can imagine the jaws or the springs um, you can just tell by looking at it, are significantly larger and have a lot more force. Um, so it's the same, the same principle as that smaller 120, except know that there's going to be, you're going to have to put a lot of pressure on this to get it to open, and you're going to have to do both sides. Now, I know a lot of people don't carry 
these neat little trap setters out there and they actually make a short version that's only about yay long. So perfect for someone to put in their backpack. Um, but most people do carry with them a leash of some sort. And so you can actually open these 330 bears or, or body grippers with just a leash. So the same principle here. Unwind this. So there's our spring. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the end, one end and clip it through the eye. Now you're gonna come and take your tag in and you're gonna wrap it through. Now go up to the top come back through. Every time you go back and forth, you gain mechanical advantage on this trap. Make sure your safety is out. And I know, you know, I have the luxury of doing this in an office. I don't have a dog, you know, in the center of it, probably screaming. Um, so you have to work fast and you gotta know right away what you have to do. Um, so as you get this, remember this, this, spring is significantly stronger. So when you pull on this, you're doing it with everything you got. Don't just slowly go, you know, when I say pull on it, pull on it with everything you got. And it slipped out. So what it did is there's openings right there. And that's what my rope, since it's not a actual dog leash slip through, but you can see that a dog leash is thicker. It won't go through this. And as you wrap it through and then pull it, it pulls those jaws together. And then you latch the safety right here. And then you unhook it and go to that other side and open that or release that pressure as quick as you can. Um, this is also a good informational little brochure that we came up with um, several years ago that goes through step by step on how to, you know, the print, the basics, the parts of the trap and step by step on how to get these, um, a dog out of there. And then it goes into specific details about the body gripper traps as well and how to get how to act, deact, basically deactivate those and get your dog out of there. Um, yeah, that's really the, the basics. And if you guys have questions or comments or want to see something else, I'm more than open to, to taking those. Mandy, I'm not seeing any questions in my chat box, so I'm not sure. I think they came straight to you last time. Uh, no questions have been submitted through the chat. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, I have a question. This is Nicole. Um, Corey, if people think about questions or if they um, want to talk to someone, who should they reach out to at ADFNG? Would that be you or someone else in the office? Um, they can call the main office, uh, the 267-2257 number. That's our main information office line here in the Anchorage office. And anyone that answers that phone um, is well-versed in traps. If not, they'll forward it up to me and I'm more than happy to answer those questions and, you know, run through stuff. If people have questions, it's not a, not an issue at all. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Sometimes we, oh, go ahead. Mandy. Corey, can you give me that phone number again? I'll put it in the chat. Sure. It's 267-2257. We sometimes find that uh, people get overwhelmed with information and think about questions later. Um, and 
for everyone else's reference, um, we will also be referencing that brochure. And um, there are more videos that ADF and G has on their website going through each um, trap specifically. So um, we'll share that in the chat function as well. And we did have, I think we have time for one question, which is, uh, Corey, where can pet owners find that brochure? Um, any of the fish and game offices should have them. It's online. Um, and if you can't find it there, call the, the Anchorage Information Center and we'll track one down and get it out to you. Okay, wonderful. And also if, Nicole, if, if people are interested in carrying a set of these, like I said, there's a set that's about half the length. Um, these can be picked up at like Sportsman's Warehouse or online. There's a trapping place out in Eagle River, Alaska, trapping range and supply. They carry them. I think they're like a couple bucks. They're next to nothing and they're aluminum. So they're super light. And that's a, um, can you, a trap? A trap what? setter. Trap setter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. I do have a question. Could I ask it? I don't know how to do the chat. Very quickly, and then we'll move on. Thanks. Basically, uh, Conibear 330s are banned in Chugach State Park, but that's my understanding. But the uh, language of the regulation refers to a certain opening of the trap. It doesn't refer to it as a conibear or mm -hmm. as a body gripping. And I was curious uh, what the opening is on the smaller, on the, I guess it was a 220 trap, and, so and this, how that uh, definition of the opening works in, in defining which ones are banned. Yeah, so that, that opening is this distance right here. So this is set. So it's this distance from the top here to the bottom here. So, so is, is, is the 220 band in Chugach State Park? You know, I would have to go and measure it again, Neelan, to see what that is. I don't, the, I don't know what the, the 220s and the 120s refer to the springs. And I'd have to go back because I don't know off the top of my head what that, that measurement is for the 220s. Thank you. Thanks, Neelan. Okay, well, um, just because we have so much to go through. Thank you again so much, Corey. Um, you are, of course, welcome to stay on, but I'm gonna go ahead and mute you and turn off your video. So thank okay. you again. And um, we'll uh, share your information with folks too. Awesome, thanks, Nicole. Thanks. <laughs> okay, I am going to share my screen again. Um, one moment, everyone. And you're navigating um, Zoom technology, share screen, there we go. Okay, um, hopefully you all can see this. Um, so this is a, a brief um, little snippet from that brochure that Corey was um, mentioning about some tools that ADF and G recommends you take with you. Um, all of this will be available in the chat. Um, so we'll be sending that out, but please contact us if you have any more questions. So I'm gonna launch right into some of the regulations um, and regulations for trapping are complicated because there are so many landowners um, on the Kenai Peninsula. So I'm gonna start with the state side of the business. Um, the state manages regulations around wildlife um, through game units. So most of the peninsula is in game unit 15, which is sub broken out into 15 A, B, and C. And then um, also game unit seven um, on this side. So you can find, uh, we'll sh share the link for where you can find these maps. Um, but you can see when you're looking at regulations and where traps might be held, this is a good place to get more details. So again, this is game unit seven. So from the uh, 2020 regulations, I went ahead and put together a table um, about the species trapping season limit and some notes. Um, 
generally um, ordered by which by starting date of the season. So um, there are two, three seasons that are open now, wolf, coyote, beaver, and then squirrel and marmot at the bottom are open year round. Um, so that's something to certainly be aware of. Uh, a lot of people think that trapping only starts when the snow starts, but um, it, can, it can happen much before. Um, there's another big wave of openings in November for mink and weasel, muskrat, river otter, wolverine, marten, um, and red fox. And one thing to note um, that there is going to be a lynx season this year. So lynx populations ebb and flow with the hare populations and they only have a lynx season when populations are high enough that they deem they, that a season should be warranted. Um, so when there is a lynx season, it's um, it feels like a, a bigger deal. And so there's a lot of participation in lynx trapping um, when the season is open. So just to be aware that they're if you were out last year and there, you didn't see lynx trapping, you are much more likely to see it this year. Um, and I would like to preface that I am not a trapper, um, so this might be the blind leading the blind a little bit, but um, in speaking with trappers uh, collected, what signs of traps or trap lines you might encounter when you're out recreating. Um, the first one is that there might be offshoots from a main trail and granted there's um, a lot of reasons why people might go off trail just to explore but if you see footprints leading off of a trail um, and you know you're in an area where there's um, a season just be wary. Um, there are also trail sets where where um, traps can be put right on trails so um, as Corey was talking about with the, the snares. Um, there's also things called pole sets. So this is a pole that's leaned against the tree. You can see a, a small diagram of something like that here. Um, so that might be the in, an indication of a trap. Um, cubby sets, this is very specific to, or not specific, but relevant to the lynx season. Um, if you see a lot of sticks at the base of a tree, and then especially if you see something shiny, like a CD or a piece of aluminum foil, um, shiny objects are attractants to lynx because they're so curious. So um, this is, this is a, a cubby set and a sure sign of a trap. Um, and it should be noted that conibear traps, which was the third trap that Corey demonstrated that are supposed to kill an animal instantaneously or close to it. They're quite typical for beavers and otters, but they can be used for lynx. And so if you're out and you see a trap like this, I think it's um, good to assume that it could be a conibear. So extra caution around that. Um, with that too, I wanted to touch uh, quickly on beaver sets. So you can see in this middle diagram, um, this is the water level. This would be a beaver um, dam, a beaver lodge. So they have drowning sets that take the beaver through a weighted bag once it's trapped um, and pulls it down. So um, traps are not just on land, but they will be, um, they can be underwater as well. So um, those are some important things to look out for. Per the state rules, and again, this is for state land. Um, so this does not apply to the refuge. I'm not going to go through all of these, but um, these are things to look out for um, if you see practices that are illegal. Um, you cannot shoot from on or across the highway. You can't use poisons. Um, there are regulations in some places about landing and shooting, but those don't apply to trapping in these game units. Um, you can't use a helicopter. Um, there are some light restrictions on, on using artificial light for killing fur bears. However, you'll see that in Unit 7 and 15, which is our units of the Kenai Peninsula, um, you can use artificial light to kill fur bears from November 1st through March 31st. Um, there are restrictions on destroying beaver houses. You cannot use a dog except to retrieve dead fur bears. Um, and then uh, restrictions on motor vehicles, um, both land and by boat, but there are exceptions for wolves. So um, all of this, all of these regulations came from the regulatory packet um, that Mandy will send a link to in the chat. Um, but this is just, a, again, a very quick overview of some of the things to look for. 
And it should be noted that um, on the state side of regulations, there are no trail setbacks. Um, so they rely a lot on the Trapper's Code of Ethics, um, which are published here. And um, you'll note that these, um, when it says, for example, to check traps regularly on state land, there's no requirement for how quickly a trap must be checked. It could be weeks or months. Um, and it's up to the trapper to adhere to this code of ethics about what they deem as regular. Um, so, uh, and again, trapping in the most humane way possible, you know, there's some interpretation to that. So um, on the state side of things, there's not um, any regulations really on uh, trail setbacks um, on where traps can't be laid next to trails. There are only two closure areas um, on the refuge in game unit 15. And I'll talk about some other land management um, areas as well. But um, just, just so you're aware when you're on state land and this is state parks can be um, specified as well. When you're on state land, the setbacks, the um, some of the other regulations that we see for federal lands for the state, this code of ethics is really what is um, on the sort of front lines of trapper etiquette. So just to be informed of that. Um, so uh, state, state land, um, you know, a lot of it over here, and then there's municipalities down here, but um, the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge is managed separately because it's a federal agency. So it has different rules. So this is the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and they have developed a refuge fur bear trapping program. So to trap on the refuge, which trapping is allowed on the refuge, um, trappers have to take an orientation trap uh, class. They have to identify all of their traps and snares on state land. Trappers do not have to identify their traps. Um, depending on where they trap in the refuge, they have to check their traps every four or seven days. Um, they cannot set traps or snares within 30 feet of any site exposed bait. Um, and this is really important for recreationalists. On the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge, there is no trapping within one mile of road accessible trailheads, of public roads, and of public recreational facilities. Um, also within the Skelac Wildlife Recreation Area and around refuge headquarters in the visitor center. And I have a map on the next slide. Um, there are restrictions to conserve lynx, beaver, American martin, and red fox. And uh, again, different something that differentiates it from state land is that you cannot have serrated or toothed leg hold traps, which was the second trap that Corey um, demonstrated. So they're um, less damaging if you needed to release them. So again, this is a, a zoomed in map of areas that are closed to trapping. You can see this one mile buffer along roads and road accessible trailheads. And then the headquarters area um, up in Soldana. Um, so I want to quickly inform there's some sensitive photos coming up. So if you don't want to watch them, just look at the floor for a little bit. Um, but the regulations about trapping in the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge are up for grabs right now. Um, there is a proposed rule change that would remove those trapping restrictions that I had just talked about. So it would remove the trap buffers along trailheads, campgrounds, and roads. And again, um, in game units 15 and seven, there are, there's no closed areas except for a moose refuge um, or research center. So the refuge really has the, the majority of the closed areas to trapping um, and the setbacks. So um, this was a photo taken of a dog that had been caught in a trap on the refuge prior to these rules being put in place. Um, you could set traps within 30 feet of site exposed bait. This is really impactful for birds who see bait land and get hooked by their talons. Um, and also, you know, site exposed bait smells good. So animals investigate. Um, so it would remove those setbacks. There would be no trap check requirements. Um, so it would mirror the state regulations in that way. This is a moose that was caught in a snare and was left um, if there our trap check requirements, the logic is that um, agencies could get to the animal and release it before it dies. So this is this was a bycatch mitigation regulation. 
and then it would remove those restrictions for lynx, red fox, American martin, and beaver. Um, it would also allow brown bear baiting and would remove the no firearm buffer area in the upper um, Kenai and Kisilaf rivers for the spring, winter, and fall. Um, and so if you're a dog uh, walker, if you recreate with your dogs and you use the areas that would be impacted by these changes, we really encourage you to submit a comment by November 9th. And there is a hearing next week, Monday at 4 p.m. Um, we'll send the registration information for that. And if you're thinking, I'm not a biologist, I don't know that I can comment on this, you definitely can because your experiences on the refuge make you subject matter experts. Um, and you know the refuge is, is public land. So um, we're gonna have a training on Friday at noon, it's virtual. And if you go to that training, you'll leave with a template on how you can comment, how you can um, attend that hearing. And we would really love to see you there because now is the time if you care about this issue and trapping regulations, um, you are uniquely positioned to make a big difference on what trapping regulations look like moving forward on the refuge. Quickly tying on to other lands, there's state parks. Um, since we had so much to go through, I did not uh, go through you know, Ketchmack Bay State Park, but do make sure to contact those land managers before you go to make sure that you um, have the information you need, what you can expect. Private property is off limits to trapping, but trappers can get permission from the landowner. So it doesn't mean that there's no traps. So definitely check with the landowner. Um, municipal, sorry, municipalities in the borough, um, there is no trapping within the city limits of Soldatna, Kenai, Homer, and Seward. Um, and so those are all through city codes um, or uh, you know, city ordinances. And then native land, um, be sure to consult with the tribe that owns it to see what um, regulations they have in place. And if you don't know which land it belongs to whom, that's very normal. Um, Mandy will send it in the chat, but there's a Kenai Peninsula borough map that has an interactive parcel viewer. And this is what I use to see who owns what. Here's a little zoomed in image of um, all the different landowners just in this um, little area abutting the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. So that's a really helpful tool. And then finally, um, reporting. So similar to how regulations change based on whose land you're on, federal versus state, um, reporting is very much the same. Um, so if you're on state land, which is anywhere except for the refuge or in a municipality or on tribal land, private property, um, and you see you have an incident, um, your dog is caught in a trap or uh, you want to report a trap, um, you should contact the Alaska Wildlife Troopers. You can also report an incident online. Um, Mandy will send that link in the chat. If you're on the refuge, um, you should call refuge headquarters and that number is 907-262-7021. And uh, this is, I, I'm hoping maybe I can pop this window up. Um, we are excited to launch a new initiative at Alaska Wildlife Alliance. I hope you can see this. <laughs> Mandy, chime in or Teresa if you can't. Um, but there is no centralized reporting for um, trap encounters where people um, have had dogs caught in traps, how trapping impacts recreation. So we've just launched today a citizen science platform on our website where if you have an incident with a trap, if you see a trap, you can map the trap. Um, enter the date, answer a couple of questions, and that will go into a centralized form. And we will submit a report at the end of the trapping season about where traps were found um, and some of those impacts. Um, we also have a survey uh, to get more information about how trapping influences recreation um, so that we can present this to decision makers um, with some solutions about where traps are, how it how it makes people feel and what the impacts are. So um, that's this can be found at Alaska Wildlife Alliance's website, akwildlife.org backslash safe trails. And we'll be pushing this more and more, but again, it was just launched today. In fact, you're the first to see it. So um, it's very exciting. 
And I think that's the end of my section. <laughs> Thank you for racing through that with me. Um, I am going to go ahead and stop sharing so that John Morton, who is our vice president on our board and uh, recently retired super supervisory biologist at Kenai National Wildlife Refuge can take it from here. I will do that. Do you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so I'm I'm trying desperately to pull this up. Let's see if this does it. Um, hold on, give me one sec. I think I'm just about there. All right. Okay, so I, I'm I'm good now. You can see and you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, so th this is going to seem a little disjointed because we're kind of packing in um, a, a little bit about uh, about the wildlife mitigation structures that are being built both on the across the refuge, both along the uh, Sterling Highway milepost 58 through 79, uh, which is from Jim's Landing to Sterling, and then in addition there is the what's called the Cooper Landing Bypass that occurs from Jim's Landing to Quartz Creek, which is in the middle of being designed right now as we speak. And the only reason we're bringing this in now, and this is why it seems a little disjointed, is because there's an opportunity to engage with uh, DOT and their contractor at the end of this month. And um, I think uh, I, we, I, we really just wanted to get some of the information out there so people would be, you know, have that opportunity to ask questions and maybe um, help tweak the design a little bit to to be more wildlife friendly. Um, that's that's really the basis for this. And you'll also see that there is a connection here between these structures and the changes in the trapping regulations that are coming in to play here on the Kenai rule. So there's a lot of there's a lot of connection here. So it's not quite as disjointed as you you may think it is. Um, so I'm going to talk about these two projects, but obviously I'm going to spend most of my time talking about um, the first project because that's been completed. That's the Sterling Highway Milepost 58 to 79 project that was completed um, just a year ago, and uh, we're now and and the refuge is now looking at the. Uh, I have to I have to kind of give you a. I'm going to say I'm going to slip occasionally into we as if I'm the refuge. I am no longer the refuge. I'm retired, but. I was the supervisory biologist at, at, at Kenai National Wildlife Refuge for 17 years. So it's hard for me to uh, not say we. So if I say that, just realize I'm no longer speaking for the refuge. I'm speaking for the Alaska Wildlife Alliance. So let's go on with that. Um, okay, so here's some data. Uh, you guys, I think everybody here is local or from Anchorage and they know what the uh, Sterling Highway looks like. Here's some um, GPS collar data from moose, caribou, and brown bears. In this, and what we've done is I've lumped them by species. And the red in this instance is caribou. It's the Kenai lowland herd, uh, 11 individuals within that herd. The orange are individual um, brown bear sows that were collared over a, almost a 10 year period. And the yellow are moose that were uh, 50 over 50 individuals that were specifically collared for this study on the Sterling Highway in advance to get collect some wildlife movement data. And there's two things I want to point out here. One is there is a lot of activity of animals, of both of all three species, going back and forth across that stretch of the highway um, between Sterling and Jim's Landing. So there's a lot of movement. The other thing that I think is really interesting, and I just wanted to point it out to you, is that um, it's pretty obvious that wildlife are avoiding um, the urban interface. And by the urban interface here, I'm talking about that six mile wide, uh, what I call the six mile wide development corridor around Sterling. Uh, it's six miles from north to south. And you can see that as the animals come in, they're actually skirting the edge of um, the rural subdivisions, but they're not, in general, they don't want to enter it. They're not interested in coming into where people are. And it's just more of a comment on wildlife behavior than it is anything else. 
And those data really reflect, I think, what, why the refuge uh, and why my, uh, myself as a wildlife biologist, I'm very concerned about uh, what's happening on the Kenai is that we are carving it up from sort of from a north-south perspective that the Sterling Highway literally bisects. So if you look, if you go from the junction at Turn Lake to the mouth of the Kenai as the crow flies at 65 miles. And out of that 65 miles, um, as I showed you there, a lot of the Sterling uh, development corridor is, is unavailable for animal movement. And um, if you discount Ski Lac and Kenai Lake here as natural barriers, the reality is that there's only about 20% of the, you know, of what would have been here without people uh, is available for animal movement. And there's, you know, not very much, not many places for animals to go. Um, I'm gonna I'll, I'm gonna skip over some of this background material, but I, I need to kind of emphasize how important this is, so you understand why the trapping is a significant a significant piece here. So this is some work that was done by ADF and G, and, and one of the co-authors here is Thomas Thomas McDonough, who's in the research division down in uh, in Homer, and so he's a local guy. And uh, basically, I won't go into the details, but basically what it shows is that the Glen Highway through Anchorage has already created two genetically distinct subpopulations of moose. And that's because of the road. And of course, the traffic volume up on the Glen Highway is, uh, I forget the exact number, it's something like 20 million uh, vehicles a year. And that contrasts on the Kenai where we're running around 1.5 million vehicles on the Sterling Highway that bisects uh, through the refuge. But, you know, the point being that th this is the kind of thing that the refuge really just doesn't want to see over the long haul is, is different populations of animals north and south of the Sterling Highway. Um, here's some moose vehicle collision data. I told you that we did a, a pre-project uh, study uh, between 2000 and 2007. During that period, working with state troopers, we um, managed to document 168 uh, wildlife vehicle collisions. You know, basically, th these are dead animals, of which 81% were moose, so the vast majority is moose, but we also had black bear, brown bear, and caribou up in the pie chart there. Um, you know, to put this in perspective, during that period there, we were running around 30, 400, the AADT, this is uh, data from DOT, uh, Department of Transportation, um, the average annual daily traffic volumes running around 3,400 ve vehicles per, per day. And now we're running up around 4,200 uh, in more recent times. And that translates to um, annual traffic volumes of 1.3 million vehicles a year coming down the Sterling during the project time. And now we're running closer to 1.5 to 1.7 million vehicles. So lots of vehicles coming down the highway. Um, here's the big deal. So moose vehicle collisions, everybody knows when you have a collision with a moose, this is a big deal. The, but it's also a big deal from, um, you know, from a wildlife population perspective. So this shows, um, Two, two pieces of information here. The red line is the uh, general season harvest statistics for the Kenai Peninsula. And the blue is the moose vehicle collision data for the Kenai Peninsula. And what's interesting about this is you can see that the lines come together in recent years. And the takeaway message here is that we kill as many moose each year on the Kenai Peninsula with our cars as we as hunters kill with their guns. So this is a pretty appalling statistic. And the more significant piece about this is that obviously most of the moose that are killed by hunters are bulls. The difference is most of the vehicle or most of the moose killed by uh, in moot vehicle collisions are uh, cows and cats. So basically we're taking out the reproductive cohort. So the damage that we do with cars is much worse than the damage we do with um, uh, we do with hunting, by any stretch of the, you know any stretch of the imagination. And of course, they're very expensive. So this is uh, some data that was 
um, generated by the Federal Highways Administration for a report to Congress. And moose, a single moose vehicle collision averages around $31,000 when you take in account all of these different uh, pieces. And the Alaskan um, Moose Federation estimates $36,000 and they include um, emergency response um, costs as well. So no matter how you split it, we're talking about $31,000 to $36,000 per moose vehicle collision. And if you do this simple math of about 200, de 250 dead moose on the Kenai uh, each year, that number means that we're losing seven to $9 million per year on the Kenai because of moose vehicle collisions alone. And of course that doesn't include, um, you know, the, the, the horror of human uh, fatality. And so the, the Sterling Highway, you know, milepost 58 to 79 project was a pretty straightforward project. They basically, the high DOT was very interested in doing um, road improvement, um, you know, they wanted to put in some passing lanes, wanted to widen the shoulders to eight feet. And a lot of these, you know, most of us think this is all really a good thing to do. But, you know, along the way, we're also interested in doing wildlife mitigation. And the, and the refuge and DOT have slightly different um, goals here. DOT is obviously very interested in reducing moose vehicle collisions from a safety perspective. The refuge is just simply interested in we are interested in, well, I shouldn't say we, the refuge is interested in reducing um, moose vehicle collisions as well. But the real interest of the refuge is to ensure that wildlife can get across the road safely. It's not that we're, we're not concerned about uh, human safety, but we are concerned that wildlife can move freely across the highway. So the two preferred ways of doing this, or the two general ways of doing this are wildlife overpasses and wildlife underpasses. And very early in the project design, um, there was a pretty much a, a clean decision to take wildlife overpasses off the table, which is really kind of a crime because we know that ungulates like moose and caribou prefer to use overpasses. They feel safer walking across an overpass than through a tunnel. A lot of animals like um, bears and, and uh, um, lynx will use underpasses, but um, moose, not so much. So, when we got around to designing, you'll see how big some of our underpasses are to kind of accommodate uh, this fact that uh, moose and caribou don't really like that tunnel effect of, of a wildlife underpass. I'll show you that shortly. But here's also some data. Um, this is data that we collected in advance of, or the refuge collected in advance of the, um, of, of the project starting. And again, the red is that those 168 uh, wildlife vehicle collision uh, data, you know, I showed you a pie chart earlier. And that's what you see in red at the top of these bar graphs and each along these uh, mileposts. Uh, the, the yellow is what was reported on a wildlife hotline that we had active uh, during the years of the study. And the blue are GPS crossings from radio collared animals. <clears throat> and the piece that I want to really highlight here is this area, for those of you that are local, at, at down there by Lily Lake. And part of the reason why we have so such a high collision rate in that area is because of that big bend in the road uh, at Lily Lake. And so that became one of the focus areas. And you'll see, I'll, sh I'll show you, this is basically the justification for putting in some fencing along there. We have two and a half miles of fencing in that area was to really we cut back on the collision rate that was occurring in this because of the big bend in the road. Because you know, you're going at highway speeds, you're coming around the bend and there's a moose and you don't really have a lot of time to react. Whereas el elsewhere on the Sterling, you know, you've got a long uh, sight line. So what there what we have there um, on the highway, I'll speed this up a little bit, is we've got um, five underpasses. Uh, this again between Jim's Landing and Sterling, we have five underpasses and we have a new bridge. And those are the structures and I'm going to walk through them very quickly. So he, starting in the west, this is closest to Sterling. So the gray line is uh, right here is, is uh, to the west of that is all, you know, subdivisions and to the right of it is refuge. We have one very small, this is the smallest of the underpasses. Uh, it's only eight feet and all the heights I'm giving you are net. And by net, I mean that when you put in the culvert, you have to put in um, 
you know, dirt down below, and that takes away from the height of the uh, of the design of the culvert. So that's what this culvert there looks like at milepost 75.3, and there's a person standing there to give you a, a relative perspective on the um, on the culvert height. Uh, the next one was is a dual structure that we put at um, out on the flats. Uh, at milepost um, 73.4, so just around the corner, really. And this is this dual structure. And these are pretty big. Let me back up a little bit. These are uh, 16 feet high, 16 feet high culvert. So there's, these are pretty hunky. And then if you go a little bit further east, you're going to run into the east fork of the Moose. And I think most of you are aware that we have a new bridge there. Um, and prior to that, we had this old 10-foot uh, um, hide uh, culvert with, that the East Fork uh, ran through. And now we have this new bridge that was designed at 18 feet high and 104 feet wide. And when I say that's the dimensions under the bridge. So uh, this is to really facilitate animals moving under. And it was really, this was, this was kind of, we put a lot of money into this and this was um, designed to uh, accommodate caribou and moose. And then between the dual culverts, and the East Fork of the Moose Bridge, that's the high, um, high impact area. That's where the bend in Lily Lake occurs. So there we put in a 2.3 mile fence on either side of the road. And what it does is it connects the dual culverts and it runs eastward to the East Fork of the Moose. So the, the fence itself is anchored by two wildlife structures. So we're basically forcing animals that are coming down you know, from a north-south direction. They hit the fence. No matter which direction they go in, they're going to hit a wildlife underpass. And the fence was designed at nine feet tall to keep anything big from jumping over it. Uh, the other thing is that it's one foot off the bottom, and that's to make the fence permeable to small animals, because we want small animals to be able to get under it and move if they need to. Um, the other thing we put in there was we put in what we call jump outs. And these jump outs have no moving parts, so there's nothing to freeze up in the winter. And what it is, is they're, they're, they were staggered every eighth of a mile, actually, well, every quarter of a mile, but staggered. So they end up being every eighth of a mile uh, in that 2.5 mile stretch. So we have 22 jump outs. And what this is, is animals that accidentally get trapped on the road, they don't, you know, they don't behave the way we want them to. And uh, they end up on the road. Now they're on the wrong side of the fence. And so what the jump outs are uh, set up to do is to allow animals to get off the highway. And basically they step down from this big seven foot drop and they're not likely to go up seven feet, but they're very uh, willing to go down seven feet. And I'm talking about moose in this instance. Um, if we continue further east, uh, as you go up the, the big hill um, and you get to the top as you're headed out of, the, out of the flats there, we have another big culvert. This is the biggest of all the culverts we put in. It's 122 feet and the reason why, long. And the reason why it's so long is because it's the only culvert that we put under a three lane section of the highway. All the other ones were deliberately placed, including the bridge on a two lane, because what we're trying to do is reduce the tunnel effect of these culverts. And in a perfect world, we would have had this under a two lane section, but we just couldn't make it. So it's, but it is a very big one. You can see how, how tall it is relative to the person who's uh, standing in the photo there. And then if you continue further east towards Jim's Landing, you're gonna run into two more underpasses. One at, um, the upper one is at uh, Upper Gene Creek. Um, uh, Upper Gene Lake, and you're kind of facing north towards Mystery Creek Hills now, which of course are all burned. And in the picture down below, that one is very close to Jim's Landing, and there you're in that culvert. I'm looking south, and you're looking out towards Prize Creek on the other side of the Kenai River Canyons. So that kind of gives you a sense of where these things are. Um, this is a lot of money. This this stuff all cost 10.5 million dollars to build. But I, I want to remind you that every year on the Kenai, just for moose alone, you know, we estimated 7.5 to $9 million a year on the Kenai uh, Peninsula in the sense of uh, loss, economic loss to moose vehicle collisions. So over the long haul, this thing will start to pay for itself. The big question is, do they work? 
Okay, so this was a photo I took very early uh, after they were uh, put into place. We started to see some signs that uh, moose were in fact starting to use the culvert. This is one of the dual culverts at the end of the 2.5 mil, million, uh, 2.5 mile fencing. Um, but we have, I've got some more photos that I've gotten from the biotech who has been assigned at the refuge to uh, put camera traps out. Here's some moose going into one of the underpasses. And so we're getting good data. We know moose are using the, the culverts, which really is a nice thing to find because I, I told you that uh, the preferred one is an overpass, not an underpass. Um, here's a moose uh, that I took last winter. And this was a moose who was actually using the jump out, ended up on the wrong side of the fence. And sure enough, it was a, the cow is already, uh, the calf has already gone through. The calf has already jumped through and this is the cow that is following uh, its calf over the over that seven foot jump. Uh, here's a black bear going through and we have uh, some really lousy photos of brown bear. So I, that's why I'm not showing it to you. Here's a great shot of a, a lynx, uh, mom lynx and a, and a kitten going through. I, this is a great photo, I love it. And um, so here's what I, I wanna tell you about its connection with trapping. <laughs> this is a, an image that, um, that Nikki showed you guys earlier. This, this is the one mile buffer that's been put into place um, with the current trapping program on the Kenai uh, Refuge that puts it, it, it's effectively a one mile buffer along the road system. And that includes, <clears throat> that basically includes the entire section along the Sterling Highway that we have put in this $10.5 million worth of wildlife mitigation structures. And when we put these in, trapping was not an issue. So we didn't even think about, well, what would happen if people started to trap along either the 2.5 mile fence line or along any of these culverts. And uh, it, it, when we started to realize just recently that uh, what this new proposed Kenai rule uh, is offering to do, which is to take away the program, all of this would be trappable. And we suddenly realized this is a big deal because this was designed to help wildlife. And now it's gonna go from helping wildlife to being a population sink for wildlife. And so this is like a, a horrible, horrible scenario here. And the same, the same thing plays out in the Cooper Landing Bypass. Um, that's being designed right now. And, and uh, this is a very small image photo but again, the Cooper Landing Bypass starts over here on the west. I think you can see my cursor at Jim's Landing where the other project ends and it continues all the way through to Quartz Creek on the other side of Cooper Landing uh, down there by Kenai Lake. And right now what's being proposed are four underpasses, one here at Fuller Pass or uh, at the, near the um, beginning of Fuller Creek. Uh, one a little bit further east um, at milepost, uh, close to milepost 56. Um, there's a big under uh, overpass that's being proposed here above milepost. This is this will be on the new section of the uh, the bypass that's being developed right now. Um, is an overpass, and uh, there's some uh, there's some other things being proposed there too. But uh, at least in the original uh, environmental impact statement, that's that's what was there. Um, then there is a new bridge that's being built over Juno, uh, Juno Creek, which could serve as a wildlife um, mitigation, but I can I'm going to show you something to indicate why it's not really being considered at this point. And then there's two more uh, underpasses to the east of uh, Bean Creek being proposed. Um, this is the Juno and Bean Creek site. I just want to show you this is for people who are in the Cooper Landing area or anybody who's interested in calling in at the end of this month to DOT to ask them questions. This is kind of a big deal. I'm going to show you this real quickly. So the area be in, that's in the red, that is, those are the trails on either side of, well, they're not trails, but they're, they're basically elevation markers um, on either side of Juno. Creek where the bridge is going to be built. And the thing that's, that is negating the effect of this bridge for wildlife is the resurrection trail runs up the west side underneath. And it kind of, kind of coinciding with this red line, it's running up underneath. 
And over on the east side of Juneau Creek, what you see here, I'm gonna, if you see my cursor down here, I'm gonna show you, here's the existing Bean Creek Trail, which Bean Creek Trail, which comes out of Cooper Landing, for those of you that know that. It comes up, um, comes out of there. And what they're proposing to do is deviate it all the way over. So it's a realignment of the trail to bring it so it allows snow machiners and these are subsistence users to go under the bridge on this side and then continue back up to the old Bean Creek Trail. And the reason why this is so problematic from a wildlife perspective is it's a very narrow bench on either side that we're forcing both people and wildlife to use. And we continue to you know, hammer the point that this is not mitigation for wildlife. This is, uh, is actually setting up to be a conflict area for you know, things like for uh, brown bear DLPs, black bear DLPs, and that kind of thing, because we're forcing animals and wildlife together. And I think the truth is a lot of wildlife will simply avoid it. Um, any rate, I just want to bring that to your attention. There's, uh, you can go on to www.sterlinghighway.net. This is DOT, DOT site. You can get all the information. There's a live chat uh, with project team members set up on October 27th. There's an in-person, you can, if you're in the Cooper Landing area, you can actually meet at the Cooper Landing Community Hall on Thursday, October 29th with people. I, but you have to reserve a 20 minute time slot in advance. So go to this website to get the info and to reserve your site. And this is my last slide. These are some questions that I think people in the Cooper Landing area should give some thought to. One is what prevents trappers from trapping at the wildlife crossings? And the short answer is there is nothing. And so even as these wildlife mitigation structures are being um, you know, planned for and designed on the uh, Chugach National Forest, um, there is nothing that is preventing trappers from trapping there. And this is just outrageous to me. Um, I, I really encourage people who are familiar with uh, the Cooper Landing access to the Resurrection Trail to uh, ask questions about why people, why the uh, Gene Creek Trail is being rerouted. Um, something here, here's this third question, what happens to wildlife after they cross the bypass? To me, this is a big deal. When you're over on the refuge side of the Sterling Highway, when an animal crosses the Sterling Highway, it's going from refuge to refuge. So all they have to do is get across the highway. Well, the difference now is with the new bypass, when an animal is coming from the north and it crosses the, and, and it's in Chugach National Forest, when it crosses the bypass, what does it cross into? And it doesn't cross into Chugach National Forest. What it crosses into is a bunch of private parcels. So all we're doing is we're driving the animals where into a sub, you know a parcel a, a, a developing landscape, and in some instances, if we don't create green space for the wildlife, all we're doing is we're feeding them into an area that we could very well have increased DLPs and uh, you know wildlife uh, human conflict for for no reason at all because of poor planning. So that's another one that I think people need to be asking about. I encourage people to ask about why is part of the new connecting road at Sportsman's Landing being built closer to the Kenai River? And the reason I bring this up is one of the primary reasons for um, that has been you know, down in paper and been vocalized for building the bypass in the first place was to get the road away from the river from a, you know, the concern about catastrophic um, oil spills. And uh, yeah, it, that's what the bypass does, except there is a new connecting road that's being proposed very close to Sportsman's Landing, which is a high use area. And what that does is it brings people from the bypass back to the old Seward Highway, old Sterling Highway, if they want to continue um, into um, uh, Cooper Landing. And lastly, as a, you know, because this is a wildlife oriented uh, webinar here, they, I think people need to ask who pays for managing invasive plants that are likely to be introduced by the fill or by heavy equipment being used on the project. So I'll leave it there and uh, I'm passing it back to you, um, Nicole.
Nicole, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> um, I know we went a little bit over. Thank you, John, so much uh, for that. And uh, we, John and I are available to stay for questions. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat function um, and Teresa will be moderating those. Um, in the meantime, as you're letting the juices flow and percolate, uh, I wanted to give a few announcements about um, and recap about what you can do after this. Um, the big thing first, of course, is to uh, get involved with the Kenai rule. Those uh, proposed changes will impact people who use the refuge. And again, the refuge is the only place really um, on the Kenai Peninsula, aside from municipalities, with setbacks, with um, trap setbacks from trails. So um, if that's an issue you care about, um, please visit our website. We have that training on Friday at noon. We would love to have you, it's virtual. We'll also be recording it if you can't make it um, and we'll put that on our website. Um, that's a really big issue, really topical um, issue. And then of course, as John said, Mandy threw it in the chat, um, but now is also the time to comment on um, and ask questions of DOT about those important um, underpasses and overpasses overpass, I should say. Um, a couple other announcements. Um, if you're not on our mailing list, we send an email once a month with news and updates, um, all of our action alerts, ways to get involved. You can sign up for that on our website at akwildlife.org. Um, and then I, I'm looking at the, the names in front of me. I see some members, some people I know, some people we don't know. So welcome if you haven't been to one of these before. And thank you again to those who continue to support this program. Um, we are able to do these programs for free um, as a nonprofit, but we do rely on membership donations. So if you're not a member and are interested in supporting our work, you think this work is valuable, we would love to have your support um, and you can sign up to be a member at akwildlife.org. So that's my pitch. Um, Nicole, I, I have a, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, so, so one person said, um, going back to, to some of the trapping rules, one person said, could you, or are you going to go over some of the rules of trapping as far as where they can be on the trail? Like how far off the trail or can they be anywhere along the trail? Great question. And yeah, I realized I did not explicitly say. Um, so again, it depends on the land manager. Um, for the refuge, currently there's a one mile buffer from trailheads, road accessible trailheads and roads. So that does not necessarily extend all the way to the end of a trail. And again, that could be revoked in just a couple of weeks. So um, that's one aspect. On all the surrounding state land, there are no setbacks at all. So um, anywhere, basically. Okay. <laughs> um, and that's, yeah, it's something that um, Alaska Wildlife Alliance has been involved in. Um, we have some people on this call who were really instrumental in um, getting a setback ordinance in Anchorage last year. That was a huge effort that put a 50 yard buffer around trails in the Anchorage Bowl. Um, and we would love to get something like that on the Kenai Peninsula. So if you are interested in getting involved, if this is an issue you care about, please email um, us. Uh, Mandy can throw those emails in the chat. Um, and take this, the citizen science survey, because that's something we really want to move towards. So um, in short, no, there is nothing. Um, and then the, another question was, uh, which areas around Anchorage, because we have some people on here from Anchorage, and this is if you know, um, which areas around Anchorage are most prone to have traps near trail uh, heads or trails where that are families with dogs that share are sharing it with families with dogs? Um, great question. And um, so last year, like as I said, there was a, an ordinance passed by the Anchorage Assembly that puts a 50 yard buffer um, between traps and trails. So that should be um, in place anywhere within the Anchorage municipality. Um, there's also a list of there, I should say they're regulating that from a list of trails that were um, 
identified by the assembly. It's quite a robust list. Um, so um, that information can be found as to which trails are protected um, and trailheads and campgrounds are also protected. So um, that can be found on the municipality website, but whoever asked that great question, if you'll email me at nicole at akwildlife.org, I can send that information to you um, as well. And again, that's for the Anchorage municipality. Once it crosses um, into other you know, game units and, and outside of the scope of that ordinance, um, I don't feel prepared to speak to that, but um, that would be a good place to start. So actually Anchorage is quite a safe place, relatively, um, again, a 50 yard buffer on either side of the trail. Okay, and then um, somebody asked, who is pushing for the removal of these setbacks, et cetera, in the refuge? And uh, could you provide again the uh, timeframes for the training hearing and comment periods for the Kenai Refuge rule? Yes, great question. Um, and John, feel free to hop in on this too. Um, so Fish and Wildlife Service um, is the agency overseeing refu the refuge system. And um, this is actually a Fish and Wildlife Service proposed rule. It, uh, May not surprise anyone on this call that uh, the administration on a federal level has taken an interest in trying to dismantle um, federal control over their own lands. So in a way, um, I mean, this was bred from a secretarial order that snowballed into a proposed rule change by essentially the refuge itself or the, the agency, Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, however, it is, um, as you said, open for public comment. Um, it, there was a comment period this summer um, and it got reopened recently. So the deadline to submit comments is November 9th. That's written comments. You can find that on the federal register. I believe it's in the chat, um, but we also have it uh, on our website, akwildlife.org. We have a fact sheet with all of this information. Um, and thank you, Mandy, for sending that just as I said it. Um, on Friday, this Friday, just two days, at noon Alaska time, we are having a virtual training on Zoom, much like this, with our wonderful friends at Trustees for Alaska and Alaska Wilderness League. And um, that'll be an hour long training. Um, and we're going to do a brief overview about what the rules entail. Um, and then we'll lead you through prompts that, uh, you know, so we'll put up a prompt, you'll write for a couple minutes, we'll ask another prompt, we'll write, you know, you'll write for a couple of minutes. And then by the end of that training, you'll have an outline for your testimony. Um, so that's a really good, and, and that doesn't just mean that you're only prepared to speak to the Kenai rule, it'll prepare you for speaking at any hearing. So um, highly encourage you all to attend that. The hearing itself um, is scheduled for Monday, October 26th at 4 p.m. And each person will have two minutes to speak. Um, there's been so much interest in this rule. Um, both from people who would like to see trapping restrictions be liberalized, who would like to be able to trap right next to roads and trailheads and on these underpasses. Um, so it's really important that we get people at that hearing who are vocalizing their opinions. Um, and the hearing might bleed into Tuesday and Wednesday evenings as well, but you can register at this link. Uh, Mandy can send the registration link. Um, again, this is all on our website and they'll tell you what slot you will testify and what day you'll testify in. Um, I know this is a lot of information, again, all on our website. Um, so thank you and we would love to see you there. Bring a friend or 20 friends. The more we have, the better. Hey, Nikki? Yes. Yeah, this is John. I, I was going to just add a little piece to your response to the, the last person's uh, questions about what's what's behind this. The, the other piece that's behind it is is really the proposed rule is um, it, it the Department of Interior is kind of forcing the refuge to settle with the state of Alaska and with Safari Club International who are suing the refuge. And the whole reason why this is coming about, normally the Department of Interior, which is the, you know, is the umbrella um, department over the Fish and Wildlife Service, normally they would support the service and the refuge. Uh, but under this current administration, they're supporting the state. 
And so <laughs> this is why you see this very twisted um, politics right now that are, are kind of playing out. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good point. Okay, and then you touched on this briefly in your presentation, but do traps have to be marked as to location anywhere? Does, do they have to tell anybody? And is that information available to the public? Um, I think your map project is trying to accomplish that, but yeah, do you wanna kind of address that? Do they have to tell anybody where they put their traps? Um, again, depends on state versus fed. State land, no, not at all. And actually the traps themselves don't have to be marked. So if someone puts a trap, um, you know, right on a trail, someone's dog gets caught, they're not legally required to have their name on the trap. So you can contact them and say, this is what happened. Um, so no, <laughs> no, there's no trap marking. Um, and I, I should also say um, it is illegal to tamper with someone's trap. So just so you know that, obviously if you're in a situation of a dog getting caught, go for it. Um, but I should, I should have said that. Um, uh, for, and John, help me out on this. Um, under the current trapping program, I believe that um, beaver lodges do have to, that are, have a trap do have to be marked. Um, no, yeah, they, they, no, the, the, well, first of all, if you're trapping on the refuge under the refuges program, you do have, the traps themselves are actually labeled. Right with the, with the, with uh, some kind of ID. So you don't know the location, but if you encounter the trap, you can at least figure out who, who the traps belong to. Um, as far as the beaver uh, portion goes, that, that's a, that communications actually for other trappers because um, the refuge is trying to uh, be fairly conservative in, in uh, beaver trapping and not take too many uh, beavers out of the same lodge. So the idea is that if one trapper has already taken a beaver out of a lodge, you mark it so that the, another trapper will not come and take a beaver out of that lodge. Mm -hmm. So it's a way, it's a way of, of being a little bit more, um, you know, conservative um, in beaver management. And that would go away on, if uh, the refuge um, trapping program disappeared. And um, just to also reiterate that point as well. So on the refuge, um, trappers are, as part of the permit, they are required to label their traps. Um, where traps are placed are not public information. And one of the reasons that we're launching the citizen science program is that um, agencies do not have to report where trap encounters were. And so um, Department of Fish and Game said that they have two to three dogs caught and or killed by trap in traps per year that they hear of, but there's no um, public release of that information. So a big part of, of why we need help understanding where these traps are, and we encourage you to share that citizen science um, form is so that we can know what trails, what land, where people are seeing traps um, so that we can have a more targeted approach to advocacy on those in those areas. I, th I think the piece too that you know, I mean, the more you get into into understanding what's actually happening, I think I think there's a much bigger story here, and that is um, the the current refuge trapping program originated from a very lengthy process, a public process that occurred back in the early 1980s after um, Anilka, and. Uh, it was a long process and basically there were a lot of people at the time, locals on the Kenai that were unhappy with trap trapping activity and trappers were unhappy with other trappers because they were trapping on top of each other some, in some instances. And so the refuge program was designed to deal with both of these problems to make the public happy, the general public, the non-trapping public happier. And it was designed to make trappers themselves happier with other trappers. And that's what the program is all about. And by removing the refuge program, we're gonna go right back to 1980. We're gonna go right back to having issues with, if we make this consistent with state regs, uh, we're gonna have a lot of problems again. Okay, and uh, I don't have any other questions, but I would like to make a, a couple quick comments and, and maybe get what you guys think about them. Cause I've told, talked to Nicole about this, but. There, there are places that we I've been hiking, and I think this is a great idea for, for people, but I'd like to get some feedback where you go there, and 
I've actually seen people post signs saying there are traps up ahead. And I don't know if it's being posted by other hikers or if it's actually the trapper is doing the right thing and posting it on, you know, on trails where they know people go with their dogs too. Because if I go out there and I see a sign and I have my dogs, they go on their leashes or we don't hike there. It's that easy for, for me to make that adjustment. We go someplace else where there's not a sign. What do you guys think about posting signs um, where, where they know there's traps just to warn people? Yeah, it would be um, certainly one <laughs> way to go. Um, and actually we have on the call, I think Lorraine Temple who did post some signs asking that um, trappers move traps from trails, um, many of which were taken down because they were not approved by the land owner. In that case, oh. I think it was mostly <laughs> national forest. So there's um, some, some limitations there. Um, and in uh, my experience working with, in some of these groups uh, about safe trails and sharing trails, I found that trappers um, can be quite vocal and sensitive to telling people where their traps are. Um, one, because it, it could create competition with other trappers, but two, um, not wanting to be blamed for um, if, you know, if someone moved I've heard a lot of, well, someone could move my trap and then it's in an area that's bad and I didn't put it there, but it was like an act of terrorism. Um, we've heard that before, so. Oh, um, I don't know, Ali, um, one second. If you can type in the chat, that would be great. Um, so uh, we haven't seen much of a, a concerted effort for signs, um, but those are some, those are just, that's just been my experience with signs so far. Okay, and you know, while we're waiting for Ali's uh, question or comment, if everybody, if everybody can just put where you're from in the chat, we would also really like to have that before we sign off real quick. And let me, let me, let me put, post that question. Um, the comment was maybe spray paint, red paint in the area to let others know there is a trap there. I mean, I think it's important to, um, you know, the wilderness experience and, and you don't want to cause more damage um, to mark these areas. So um, I would encourage people not to, you know, kind of go rogue. Um, uh, yeah, I think the best, the best thing you can do is report. Um, if you see a trap on a trail, um, report it to the land manager. Um, you can report it to us and we can try and, and get more information. Um, but, you know, we don't want to we don't want to litter, we don't want to mark, or, you know, I think, um, while I, I completely understand the sentiment, I would advise, I think, against that specific practice. John, did you have any comments? Yeah. <laughs> no, got nothing. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. And instead of Nicole making you try and figure out how to share your screen again for that last thank you slide of mine, I'll just Thank uh, everybody for joining us, uh, especially AWA members and anybody else. I also encourage you to go to akwildlife.org. Um, thank you both very much, Nicole and John, for taking your time this evening with us to share all of this information. And if people do have other questions, email one of us and we will do our darndest to get an answer to you. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Teresa, for moderating. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, That's thanks, great. Teresa. See you, Nikki. Yep. <laughs>